Good afternoon. I'm Greg Musil, Chairman of the Board of Trustees of Johnson County Community College. We have all seven trustees here, and I'll call the August 19, 2021 meeting to order. If you would help me, uh, as we always start our meeting, honor our country with the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, and again, welcome to the meeting. I take my glasses on and off because they fog up. Um, as everyone can see, we're back in masks um, because of the recent outbreak and surge in COVID cases locally, regionally, and nationally. I thought I would take the chair's prerogative for a minute and just indicate to folks that I think we can, we have within our means to eliminate masks and eliminate a lot of the restrictions we want if we will simply practice social distancing, practice masks when necessary, and get vaccinated. So I would encourage everybody uh, to do that. <coughs> So we can go back to uh, not having masks at our meeting or in our, in our classrooms or otherwise. Um, the next item on the agenda, I will note the, uh, that we have a quorum with all seven members. Um, the next item is our awards and recognition. And the first one is interesting, the Udmurt State University Letter of Appreciation to Dr. To Dr. Easley Giraldo. Mickey. Change pace. Uh, Dr. McLeod, <laughs> we have changed our podium, so. Fancier, huh? Oh no! See, you two get used to this. I feel this court. I feel like I'm. I feel like I'm before the appellate division here. Where are my lights? My red lights. Uh, uh, Mickey McLeod, Executive Vice President of Academic Affairs. Uh, I often get to address you, uh, and not often enough for moments like this. Uh, Johnson County Community College has been a sister school to a number of colleges and universities around the world. We have availed our students of opportunities to study other cultures, to travel, uh, and to expand their understanding of the world. And one of those uh, sister schools is Udmurt State in Izhevsk, Russia. Uh, we have been working with Udmurt State for 23 years now. And during that 23 years, we've had a robust exchange of cultural information, understanding, we've shared faculty, uh, and administration has visited back before I got here. Um, and we still continue to trade information and have our students engage with one another. And so the, the faculty and staff at Udmurt State felt it important at this point to recognize a Johnson County faculty member, uh, Dr. Terry Easley Giraldo, who has worked uh, steadfastly with Udmurt State since 2012 utilizing her intercultural communications classes and allowing our students to work with Russian students in real time as well as asynchronously to share in intercultural understanding, to work on communication skills with one another, and to help one another uh, span language barriers as several of the students from Udmurt State happen to also be majoring in English, they are allowed to practice their language by working, <laughs> writing papers, and engaging in debates, social, sociological, and otherwise, with American students. We have been a part of this exchange for quite some time now, and I've had the honor of being a part of that exchange as one of the judges for some of the speaking competitions, extemporaneous and otherwise, uh, that Dr. Terry Giraldo has, has had for these students. And it has been um, a really, enlightening opportunity to see how in the in the depths of you know global turmoil and issues that we might have that still teachers and students no matter where they are are teachers and students and that we can continue to bring younger generations together in a way that maybe we were not able to socialize together to understand one another to learn from one another and to share in one another's knowledge language and culture and so I, with that I will say it was one of my greatest honors to be able to uh, receive this from Dr. Bounds' office and to be able to speak uh, a few words uh, on behalf of uh, Dr. Terry Easley Giraldo, and she, but she is able to join us tonight, and so I will throw it to her via Zoom if she would like to say a few words about this honor that's bestowed upon her by her colleagues at Udmurt State. Dr. Easley Giraldo, while you're waiting for Zoom, uh 
Thank you. I think the board is well aware of all the things you do here locally. This was a, a surprise to me when I read the letter and, and made me very proud of you and, and this college. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McLeod. I'm honored by the kind words by everyone. I'm doing this exchange is one of the favorite, my most favorite things I do here at the college. My friends at other institutions always say that they're very jealous of all the awesome opportunities and partnerships we have. But I think the most important reason we do it is for the students and bringing opportunities to them that they might not have otherwise. And every semester they say that getting to communicate with Russian students or Costa Rican students or Netherlands students through these exchanges is the most impactful experience in this class. So I'm just very thankful for the opportunity and thank you all, thank Uber State for being so great to work with and look forward to many, many more years of collaboration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I wish what I wanna ask is that if Dr. Bound, if you would circulate the letter. I absolutely will. To yes. all trustees yep. so you can read what uh, what the Udmart, Udmart State, Udmart? Udmart. 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 Udmart State University. Udmart. I think they're the Wildcats. Um, <laughs> says about our school and about Dr. Easley Geraldo, that would be great. Any, anybody else have comments or questions they have at this time? Who's well, Terry Easley Gerardo? <laughs> yeah, Dr. Easley Gerardo, why don't you tell, them, tell people what you do here at Johns County Community College? Good question, Trustee Cross. Mark what do I do? Yeah, what, tell, what do you do, what do you teach? You do a lot. Oh, okay. I, uh, I'm a professor of communication studies. I teach public speaking, intercultural communication, leadership and civic engagement, and political campaigns. Yeah. The only thing we would ask is you not keep score of our public speaking skills on the board. <laughs> <laughs> I used to coach debate too, but I don't do that anymore. <laughs> Thank you very much for all you do as an example of uh, the great faculty we have here. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, Part of the award is you don't have to watch the rest of the meeting <laughs> if you don't want to. That's, that's great to start out that way. That the second part of our honors awards is going to be just as great. Dr. Bound, you have a student for our spotlight again? Absolutely. And I am uh, honored to introduce to you, if you'd like to come to the podium, um, Asta Tapa. She is an international student um, and very active on campus. I won't say too much because I know she'd like to engage with you. So uh, she's a transfer student from Nepal, or a, a, an international student from Nepal. And uh, we had a delightful conversation earlier this week. I know you're gonna enjoy meeting her. What's that? Good evening, everyone, and namaste. This is my way of greeting in Nepali style. It, namaste means my soul honors and recognizes your soul. I am Asta Thapa. I am a liberal arts and science and applied science student in Johnson County Community College. I serve as the vice president in the student senate. I am a senator. I am also serving as the lead in the Sart and Dart Committee on campus. I'm also a part of the hiring committee where we're working to hire the new student director. It was a great experience doing that. Besides that, I represent the Center for Students Involvement and the Games Lounge, where I work in the Basic Needs Center to help students that are fighting with food security, insecurity. I also work in the Center for Student Involvement, and I'm also working in the Student Lounge. Besides, I am also, um, I also run the Inner Club Council, basically, with one of the student ambassadors on campus, taking care of all the 90 clubs and organizations. I'm an international student from Nepal. This is my second semester in JCCC. I love everything. It is my greatest honor to be here, to be standing here, because this is the first time in my life that I felt heard, that I felt seen, that I felt I am valued, because all my life I fought to be in this position. I fought to become a woman leader and to be a part of JCCC, to be a part of this beautiful, powerful meeting just makes me feel valuable and precious as a JCCC Cavalier. I'm the first person, first woman from my society to ever come to the United States of America to pursue my wildest dream of being educated. I aspire to become an engineer, represent women in STEM, and someday serve in the public service. 
um, because I believe that it is important as a woman to be a part of decision-making table. I long to create more student engagement and make sure that every other student like me, every other student who are often at the back seat of the table, every other student that do not know the resources on campus to know that JCCC is there. Because as a student who came from Nepal, as a student who never really knew how America works, never really went to a subway and knew how to order food, I realized that it is important to be engaged on campus, to be confident, and I know that JCC is that place where we are heard, where I've never felt different, where I've never felt like I'm an international student. I feel powerful when I walk in every morning to open the Basic Needs Center. I feel powerful when I meet my executive board in the Student Senate, and then we plan to create impact on campus. I feel powerful when I meet Dr. Bound and when I am represented in the Board of Trustees meeting, because it shows that our Board of Trustees is actually concerned about the students. And I'm so honored to represent our students. I'm so honored to work for JCCC. I'm so honored to be a Cavalier. Thank you. Wow. 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 As to the, the, the bad part is that Dr. Bound has moved our student spotlight to the start of the meeting, and it's always so powerful um, emotionally and educationally and culturally that it makes the rest of the meeting uh, seem less important. But you, are, you honor us with your presence. So thank you very much for coming to JCCC. And I'm going to ask the first question. How did you end up at Johnson County Community College from Nepal? So I was, I was actually going through one of the schools in Missouri, and I would like to always stress that when students do not get involved, when students are not hurt, when students do not come to college to do extracurriculars, there are chances that they will never finish. There are chances that they're never committed to going to that place. I felt the same. I didn't feel hurt. I felt lost. I was going through a lot of homesickness, a lot of trauma. I needed mental health support. I felt alone. And I was just looking for resources. I was looking for a place where I could be hurt, a place where I could execute my leadership. And then I contacted one of my brothers, who's my own sibling here. He went here. And he's like, well, transfer to Gen Johnson County Community College. This is the right time. And then it was a time where er the pandemic just hit everybody. The world was on its knees. And then I'm like, I'm going to come to Johnson County Community College. And it was all virtual. And I'm like knocking doors. It was snowing. And I would just go around campus, figure out things, and knocking doors. And hey, can I be a senator? I would go to CSI and ask, like, is there clubs and organization? I want to feel heard. I want to be involved. And I started everything in the mid of the semester, not knowing anyone, not knowing the language properly, knocking the door in CSI, and I just see this email, and I reach out to Student Senate, and through Student Senate, I was like, I am heard here. I wanna do it. I wanna pursue my goals. I wanna come to school. And then I got elected <clears throat> as senator. And later, that really inspired me. I felt seen, and I was like, this is what I was looking for. And then I ran for the election to be the vice president. Once I was the vice president, I knew how school worked in an administrative level. And I applied for the job to become student ambassador. And it was just like little by little, I was connecting the dots. And I'm just like two semesters away to, to finish my school with two degrees. I love JCCC. Wow. <laughs> Question, other questions, Dr. Cook. This, this is really unfair of me <laughs> to ask you this, but you obviously have a tremendous amount of passion and energy. Let's say I come to you in the student center and I'm a student that doesn't know where I'm going. I don't know how to use my day. You're involved in a lot of activities. What would you advise me to, as to how I would use my time? Perfect, thank you for the question. I love to always help students when I'm in the student center. Basically, what I would tell her, uh, tell the person that is coming to me would be to sit down. We have school planner. We have all the resources on campus. The first thing I would say is, I would definitely help the students to learn about Get Involved. There is a place you can go to JCCC website and go to Get Involved and reach out to all the clubs and organizations. Besides, I will make sure that there are resources like meditation room where students can just stop by and meditate. There, 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 place, there is a place in our school where there is counseling, where there are advisors who actually help you know what are your priorities. They sit down with you. They help you with their expertise. Besides, as a vice president of the Student Senate, I, handles all, I handle all the clubs and organizations. And we meet monthly in the Midwest Trust Center to learn about the 
um, difficulties that and the difficulties and problems that the clubs and organizations or students go through. So I would invite the student to the meeting so that we can equip them with workshops and trainings. Besides, I will also let the person know that there is a place called Student Lounge where if you ever feel bored, you can hop in and play the game and make new friends or go to library and hang out or just hang out with me when I'm in the basic news <laughs> center. I'm always there to help students. Thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, Trustee Snyder. Thank you. Uh, so this is great. As, as Dr. Cook mentioned, your, your passion and enthusiasm is, is great and, and keep doing what you're doing. You're going to be successful for whatever you apply yourself to. Uh, question for you is, as a senator, do you mm -hmm. have any priorities that we should know about, particularly any ones that might impact policy that we would direct? Um, I'm so happy to say that we've been talking to the executive board committee every other day as a student, as a because as a student, I go through a lot and when I bring those issues to the executive table, I love it when I'm hurt. So the very thing that I want JCCC to address is that I think we should really bring the mental health counseling on our school. As a student who was struggling, as a student who wanted mental health counseling, there was a time where I walked in the counseling center and asked like, is there a way I can get mental health counseling? Because it's feeling really hard and I'm like, I'm having a hard time to breathe. And then I realized that they refer us to uh, some mental health counselors and I was never able to reach because of a lot of busy schedules. So I really, really want to stress that if we bring at least like one, two therapists at school and keep like, you know, focus on mental health counseling, it'd be a great help to students like me that actually need instant support. Thank you. Well, I bet we could go on for a couple hours here, um, learning about your experience and you teaching us some things about what we can do better here. Um, and I wish we had the time to do that. We, we're we open meetings anytime, and I'll bet any trustee here would love to come to one of your meetings if you want to send us an email through the website or whatever. I'll bet some of us would, would come join you and, and help however we can. I absolutely brought that um, thing just a week before in our executive meeting, and we're working on it. We would love to have you there. Thank you so much for spending your time with us today. Thank you. Here we go again, downhill from the student spotlight. Yep. Um, that, is, that is so impressive. And I, I would honor the folks out here in the audience, the faculty representative, Dr. Liker, and our staff, uh, Dr. Weber. Um, I think you have a spokesperson maybe for the student life side and Dr. McLeod, you probably have a spokesperson for the academic side um, of, our, of our college. So thank you, Esta, for coming in today. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the open forum. The open forum is a period in each regularly scheduled board meeting where members of the public can address the board on any topics related to the college. Uh, we have no speakers for today. Um, be, when we are appearing by Zoom and by, in, by live uh, meetings, you need to register by 5 p.m. on the Wednesday before the meeting uh, on the website, and you can participate in the public comment period by Zoom, um, or you can register up until 4.45 p.m. the day of the meeting and appear live um, in, the, uh, in the board chambers. With no speakers today, we'll move on to the first board report by our college lobbyist, uh, Dick Carter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's always good to be the uh, first person after the uh the highlight to start the snowball rolling down the hill. So thank you for, for those opening comments. Hey, uh, Kansas revenues are continuing to beat projections, uh, but what makes the end of July numbers notable is the fact that this is the first month where uh, for after nearly a year, the numbers do not include direct federal stimulus dollars. Um, we'll, we'll continue to monitor that. And, and in fact, the Legislative Budget Committee will be meeting on August 31st, where they'll be reviewing the state's receipts. And by then we may have a, a good idea of what uh, August revenues look like. But I think what we'll really be focusing on, and even though there's no agenda out yet, we're hearing rumblings that there will be a request for um, reviewing maintenance of effort dollars, what has been distributed, how it's being spent uh, and, and the like. And so we'll likely be putting together, uh, a, a, if we're requested to, um, what that looks like uh, for the community college system uh, throughout the state of Kansas. And that's, that's kind of the next step, uh, at least as far as the budget process is concerned. I would say that the big news for the past week or so has been the statewide tour of the redistricting committee. Uh, there were 14 different town halls held across the state. 
with varying attendance and various uh, topics brought up at, at each one of those stops. Um, Johnson County is on track to see at least three new House seats and one new Senate seat. Wichita is likely to pick up uh, one additional House seat and rural communities continue to show population declines. I did attach to the uh, back of the report, just for your information, uh, sometimes people like to see it, the latest census numbers that uh, show the difference between 2010 and 2020, and you can see where the gains and losses are. Uh, it's anticipated that, that whatever map product the legislature passes will see a court challenge. I think the big question is, uh, will we see a, a scenario like we had in 2012 unfold where potential candidates have one to two days to determine their new district and whether or not they intend to file for, for office? It's my hope that, that we're done in advance of that time frame. Uh, 10 years ago, it was a little bit different and uh, produced some, some significant results that impacted the legislative process. So we'll see what happens there, but, but certainly the landscape is going to change in Johnson County. Last month, I reported that the System Council of Government Relations Officers met in Hayes to discuss legislative initiatives for the 2022 legislative session. Uh, since that time, a few other issues have popped up that will likely demand our attention or require some type of engagement or involvement um, on the community college level. Uh, first and foremost, I think, is, is what we're hearing uh, would be a return of merger and affiliation type legislation. There's been no bill drafted. We kind of know what the intent is. Uh, we stand ready uh, from a system level to, to offer comments, uh, but, but don't want to be dictated to by, by the Board of Regents what that looks like. So we'll, we'll be watching that process as it moves forward. Uh, an interesting one, um, certainly for, for those of you sitting around the table, uh, is a timeline. We're hearing that there could be a bill introduced for a timeline for filling a vacant trustee seat. Um, there are apparently a, a, an institution or two where there have been some vacancies for quite some time. Uh, and so there, there is likely to be legislation around what that, that timeline might look like. The process is already set. Uh, and, and we've done that before at, at the community college in Johnson County, uh, but, but there will likely be some issues addressing the time. Uh, I think that there will be a need to develop some talking points. Uh, I talked briefly, uh, although uh, again, we don't know what legislation looks like, um, but there will likely be a need to develop talking points for critical race theory. And then I think uh, something that impacts us probably more closely uh, on campus is we'll, we'll be continuing to work on wordsmithing relating to, related to budget language for community colleges. Locally, uh, this past week, we saw the formal announcement that Representative Brett Parker would resign effective August 29th. I do not believe that the Central Committee has set a date yet for uh, the selection to replace, to replace his seat. Mr. Chairman, I'd probably stop right there, except I did bring some show and tell. Um, this is the 1875 Kansas Congressional District map. And there were three districts in Kansas in 1875. And I don't know how big I am on, on the display that you're seeing. Uh, and you might not be able to see this clearly because it's very light it and on clearly. vellum of paper. But uh, this, this uh, at least we're still having four districts. And some of these districts don't look terribly different from uh, from where we are today. So Kansas 1875 to 2022. A couple of us lived through that. So uh, <laughs> thanks for bringing that up, Dick. Uh, Mr. Chairman, for, I did. Questions for Mr. Carter at Trustee Cross. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carter, uh, for that map. That was fun. And I just wanted to express my profound disappointment that you continue to display the uh, 1863 Chamber of Commerce flag <laughs> behind you. Is that right? 1864. 64. But neither way, it's not the Kansas flag, stars. right? There's 34 stars. It's a Kansas flag. Well, I have eight times, seven times five. Maybe I miscounted. So. That'd be 35. <laughs> There's 34. 34, I, thank you for correcting me, I appreciate it. I've never been able to see that bottom right corner. <laughs> thank you, Mr. That, Chair. Other, other questions for Mr. Carter, obviously we're in the summer, interim committees are, go, are going on, as, part, as you mentioned with the redistricting committee. Um, 
Reminder that 10 years ago, the legislature failed to pass any redistricting maps um, for the congressional seats, if I remember right, or Board of Education or State Senate, and all those had to be determined by the court. So I agree with you. I hope that the legislature at least put something together um, for the governor to look at and then for the courts to approve. Uh, Trustee Smith Everett. Thank you. Um, I did just want to say uh, mainly to this board, more than Mr. Carter, that the CRT issue I think will come up much stronger in this legislative session. And I think it behooves this group to have a statement. I'm sure that KACCT is doing similar things. But um, recently, uh, the, that has also bled into DEI. And so we're starting to see that people are putting the two together. And I think it's really imperative that particularly because we are getting ready to really move robustly into DEI initiatives that we're really clear that CRT is not something that we are doing here and it is really removed and separate from um, the really important work of DEI. So I just wanted to say that for the record. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would agree. And I, I think the first thing there is to dis define it in a way that's actually Accurate. logical and academic, academically sound, if that's a correct phrase. Um, because it's being used in ways that it never was intended to be. So, Trustee Lawson and then Trustee Cook. Oh, um, yeah, I attended recently a meeting where um, Kansas State uh, University president uh, was, and we were discussing the importance of discussing history. So, I think there is going to be a lot of pushback uh, around this across the state. So, I don't think we're alone. And I think there's more interest to really put something out so that we all show that we are together. Uh, so yeah, I mean, Kansas is the home of board, uh, Brown versus board, Eisenhower. I mean, there's a lot of history here. Dr. Cook. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Carter, as the population shift continues in the state of Kansas, and you, you don't have it by county, but I'm assuming with the number of cities that have lost population, uh, I didn't see it on the sheet at least, number of counties have lost population out of the 105. Uh, in your awareness of summer committees, has there been any discussion of how this population shift could impact the future of community colleges in Kansas, the number thereof? Uh, Is there any more discussion about consolidations or... <coughs> Because population impacts enrollment, I would think, and uh... it certainly does. I think, and, and it certainly impacts what um, what those mill levies look like in those individual counties when they're when they're distributed um, to fewer people. The uh, I think that's the important reason that we will be watching for whatever may come as a result of any merger or affiliation legislation, and and. A side note from that would be anything that would be connected to a statewide mill levy. Um, all of those would be something that we would be very concerned about. And, and are just I would just say that our our sense is heightened. Uh, we're on alert, if you will, for those those key buzzwords that, that we might hear. Um, I did not I don't have the county breakdown that it is out there, uh, but there is a county breakdown of what the those population shifts look like. That, that just happens to be the city one that I included. Okay. Th thank you. My understanding is Johnson County increased about 65,000, if I remember what I heard. So, um, and I think there are only four counties in Kansas that increased population in any significant amount. Uh, but I will note for the record that I grew up in suburban Frankfort, Kansas, and it increased by 0.55% from 726 to 730 people. So uh, watch out. We're, we're growing. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Mr. Carter, I think that's, that's all for you today. Thank you. Uh, we'll look for more next month. Thank you. Uh, next is the Faculty Association. Dr. Jim Liker, uh, come to the new podium. We're ready to go. Welcome. Mickey's right, this does feel like the appellate court, although I <laughs> really wouldn't know. Good evening, it's nice to be back in person, albeit with my favorite face covering. This is Professional Development Week, and to quote Yogi Berra, it's like <laughs> deja vu all over again. In fact, I thought about rereading my report from last August because <laughs> the major issues really haven't changed a lot. Regular term classes start Monday, students will be back, nine-month faculty are already back, and we're still facing a pandemic. 
The announcement that came out Monday afternoon requiring masks in indoor spaces could not have been better timed as I was just starting to prepare remarks for tonight that would have been very different from what you'll hear. Last week, after a relatively long period of quiet, the FA listserv lit up with dozens of comments by faculty expressing grave concern about the lack of a mandate. Most were worried about personal safety. Some were concerned about the logistics of classroom management, as in how do you teach and manage discussions when some students choose to mask and some don't. And others raised familiar objections about masks being a personal choice and questioned their effectiveness. As you know from my message over the weekend, my questions center more on communication how best to provide appropriate guidance that flows from the IRT to the deans, to the instructors, and ultimately to students and their families. These concerns will persist even after the requirement. Understand that most faculty haven't taught in person since a year ago in March. About 20% of classes were taught in person last year, and those who taught them have generally complimented the college for being safe and supportive. But several months ago, when the current fall semester was being decided, low infection and high vaccination rates made face-to-face -face classes look like a safer option than they currently are. So the majority of those returning are out of their comfort zones and dealing with things like PPE and reporting protocols for the first time. Therefore, I'm literally making the same ask I did a year ago, that everybody show patience that the right resources be provided to allow us to teach through these coverings, and that the full burden of enforcing masks not fall solely on faculty. We're not all good at being cops. My students say I'm pretty good at it, but that doesn't mean everybody else necessarily is. All that said, the Faculty Association officially supports the mask mandate and thanks those of you who had a role in that decision. I'd like to focus respectively on the future and the past for a minute. Last Friday, the FA sponsored a lunch for 27 new faculty with trustee Laura Smith Everett in attendance. Thank you very much. And I understand trustee Musil met this group as well. This is a very large starting class, about 8% of the whole bargaining unit, similar in size to last year, if my memory serves. And it's indicative of a generational shift new people coming aboard with different ideas about pedagogy, curriculum, technology, and diversity that will evolve the college in new directions. Conversely, yesterday, three former employees were recognized on the Wall of Honor. I was especially glad to see Julie Haas there. Julie held a number of positions, but it was in her role as director of marketing that I knew her best. We work together several times a year on events and visiting speakers for Kansas Studies and the History Department. From a faculty perspective, she was almost an ideal administrator. Listened attentively, became a partner, didn't try to transform your concept into something else, and took time to understand your goals. That's been true for many with whom I've worked and for some I work with now. I don't mean to imply it's all in the past tense. There's been a lot of talk lately about the need to be more innovative. I agree. However, in my experience, our most innovative ideas often die in the womb because we're told things like, Banner won't let us do that, which is the campus joke, by the way. I seldom, hear, I seldom heard that from the people we honored yesterday, people who were willing to take innovative but challenging ideas and kick aside obstacles that got in the way. Those traditions provide an example of what Dr. Baum mentioned yesterday about turning a culture of no into a culture of yes. There are some issues for the year ahead about which you're likely to hear more. HR is revising the way search committees are formed and trained with special emphasis on integrating DEI goals into the hiring process. FA has no objection to that in principle though we would like some rules requiring academic departments to be notified when a search is pending and when it's posted, and that all faculty have opportunity to volunteer for search committees. 
Those are sentiments I shared with Leslie Hardin and Thomas Hurd this summer, and we'll have more conversations about it going forward. There is also talk about revising the way dean's evaluations of faculty are conducted. FA and KNEA's legal position is that the evaluations process is a negotiated item, but we concur it's a discussion which needs to happen. Not only are we willing to participate, we'll be required to. And you should expect to hear more about the testing center. In July, Ty Edwards, chair of the Academic Branch Council, facilitated a meeting with TC staff and a group of department chairs to discuss possible new procedures that might help with testing in hybrid classes. As I've explained before, this goes right to the heart of student success. I don't know how we determine if students are succeeding or failing without an institutional commitment to good proctoring services. It's odd we're still struggling to find the right working partnership across branches to get this done, but the fight goes on nonetheless. There's been language introduced recently through strategic planning, which implies faculty be responsible for student success. If we're going to go that direction, then it seems fair the entire college, not just the instructional branch, hold equivalent responsibility for maintaining rigorous standards and academic integrity. Finally, we're approaching election season. I hope everyone is planning to attend the JCCC Trustee Candidates Forum on Thursday, September 2nd at 7 p.m. Um, another one of those accomplishments by Dr. Terry Easley Hirallo. She will be moderating the discussion that night. The FA and the Johnson County chapter of the League of Women Voters are co-hosting this virtual event. We had a great turnout for this two years ago, and we're hoping to repeat that success again as well as educate voters and particularly our students on the issues facing our community college. Thanks. Thank you, Jim. I, I understand exactly what you're saying, but I don't find it odd that we're still fussing about something on campus, having been here 11 years. But I understand, I understand your point is that we're, we're, we need to find a solution to that. And, and I know a lot of people are working toward it. Questions for Dr. Liker? A trustee Smith ever not not a question as much as just a comment that um, I hear you on the innovation um, component I, that a culture of yes means all levels of the nest and for my part as an individual trustee when you you all come up against a lot of no's you know let us know because we don't always know and I'm, and I'm happy to um, be part of turning that culture. It, it, is, it is very difficult sometimes for all levels of um, an organization as big as this one to be able to really embrace innovation the way we've talked about it, and I'm happy to be part of um, helping move that along when it really benefits our students. Thank you. We have your email address. <laughs> you sure do. <clears throat> Thank you, Jim. Have a great, oh, I'm sorry, Trustee Cross. Yeah. Culture of yes involves all levels of the nest. It, is that, did I get it right? Mm -hmm, yes. I'm going to steal it. That's great. <laughs> Jim, Jim, thank you for your work, uh, and thank you for all you do. Thanks, Lee. Have a great semester. We'll see you in September. Not going to sing that. Okay. We're next. Our next item on the agenda is Johnson County Education Research Triangle Trustee Cross. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, JSERT uh, has not met since mm -hmm. we last met. Uh, we'll meet again on October. 25th, uh, 2021 at K-State Olathe. I will note uh, Mayor Peggy Dunn did circulate revenues and we were up 14.1% on revenues for JSERT uh, over the last year. So that is some news in this um, chaotic, hectic world that uh, I'd like to share. That parameter. We're up 14.1% from last year. And Mr. Chair, that does conclude my report. Thank you. It's good news for the entire economy. Uh, Kansas Association of Community College Trustees, Trustee Ingram, and also the president of this organization. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, on the other hand, am very excited because we are getting ready for our quarterly meeting of KCCT, and that will be a week from this Friday and Saturday, August 27th and 28th. We will be meeting in Hutchinson. So um, for the first time since March 12th of 2020, KCCT members will be in the same place. So we're really excited about that. Um, 
our former legal counsel, Tanya Wilson, was a guest speaker that day, and I, I don't believe that there was anyone else here at that time. That's when everything was shutting down. And Tanya will be our first speaker as we reintroduce PT, or, uh, KACCT to the new trustees as well as the old trustees who will be in attendance. We are expecting 12 trustees to be in attendance from our community colleges, and I believe 14 presidents was the last count. So we'll have about 26 people there, and we're really pleased about that. We will hear from, among others, um, the Governor's Education Council member and regent, Cindy Lane. <coughs> Also, the Kansas Department of Ed Commissioner, Randy Watson, will be with us as well. Uh, the presidents are going to meet on Thursday in advance of our arrival, and we look forward to another productive meeting. Heather Morgan's meetings are jam-packed, and this will not be any exception to that. And I believe that everyone has received the agenda and the information regarding that, or it will be sent yep, out we'll, if it hasn't send been out sent out. My weekly update to you, you'll receive the link. Perfect, okay, thank you. Um, and I will share a full report at our next meeting in September. So with that, concludes my report. Thank you. Questions about KACCT? If not, we'll hear it from the foundation uh, liaison, the Johnson County Community College Foundation, Trustee Snyder. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Foundation's Investment Committee, chaired by Foundation Treasurer Pam Pop, met on Tuesday, July 27th, and the committee reviewed the quarterly report from Midwest Trust FCI Advisors. Those are the Foundation's fund managers. As of June 30th, which was the end of the fiscal year, um, we're happy to report that despite all the challenges in recent months, the foundation portfolio grew by more than 25% during the previous 12 months, ending with a total value of more than $40 million. The first foundation meeting of the new fiscal year will be held on Thursday, August 26th. That's next Thursday. This will be a foundation member social held at the Athletic Compass Complex here on campus from 4.30 to 6. Foundation members will have an opportunity to hear from Dr. Bound as well as members of the athletics department staff and get a tour of the new athletic complex. Upcoming events. There are a number of upcoming events to raise funds for student scholarships and basic needs programs. The Center for Sustainability's Harvest Dinner will be next Friday, August 27th, supporting scholarships for students in the Sustainable Agricultural Program. The event is sold out, which is good news, and it's sold out in record time, but those of you that uh, uh, tried to buy tickets and we're out of luck. Just get it on your calendar for next year. The Lace Up for Learning 5K walk, Run Walk will be returning on Sunday, October 10th with proceeds benefiting student scholarships. Uh, registrations are still available and you can find details on the Foundation's website. Uh, I, I will be there running, so if you all wanted a chance to see me overly sweaty, <laughs> That, that is your opportunity. That's a real incentive. I know, I know. I figured. <laughs> That'll raise a lot of dollars. <laughs> uh, and of course, some enchanted evening gala will return in person on November 13th. Uh, sponsorships, <laughs> table sponsorships, major sponsorships, and individual, individual tickets are all available now. Uh, you can contact the foundation office or visit jccc.edu backslash C, some enchanted evening, S E E. That is it for the foundation update. Great. Thank you. Um, that investment report is incredible. And even though Absolutely. there were some dips last year, to, to be up 25% shows some really good management. Questions about the foundation? If not, we'll move on into committee reports. And Trustee Snyder, as vice chair, is going to do the committee of the whole this month. Uh, next month, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Or, uh, Trustee Cross and then go to Trustee Ingram as the other officers uh, to do their committee the whole report as they're able. Paul. Very good. The uh, committee of the whole met via Zoom on Monday, August 2nd at 8.30 a.m. A significant portion of the meeting was spent reviewing current practices regarding procurement disclosures and approvals. Committee members expressed interest in maintaining public transparency. The administration is thinking about how to do that, make the process more efficient, and reasonably protect the identity of employees reviewing bids. Mike Neal, Chief Operating Officer, highlighted three contractual agreements. Those can be found on tonight's consent agenda on page 28 of the packet. Kate Allen, Vice President of Institutional Advancement, provided updates from the Facilities Naming Committee regarding the naming of two spaces on the first floor of the CLB associated with the Nursing Department, and Dr. Bound will discuss that further during his report. Justin McDade, the Director of Audit Services, provided an overview of trustee expenses and expense reimbursements and an overview of the college's ethics report line. 
There's been a significant decline of year-to-year year year in ethics claims. And then Rachel Lears, Chief Financial Officer, provided an overview of how this year's budgeting process has changed uh, with the passage of Senate Bill 13 this past legislative ses session. Pursuant to the bill, the college is required to publish a notice of intent to exceed the revenue neutral rate and a notice of public hearing, and we'll authorize that in just a moment. Uh, first, though, I just want to remind uh, the audience and the public that while we're going to exceed the revenue neutral rate, which is new this year, we are not increasing the mill levy over where it was last year. In fact, we're on track to slightly reduce it. So the motion, I move the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the college administration to authorize the publication of the notice of budget hearing, the notice of intent to exceed the revenue neutral rate, and revenue neutral rate hearing, and the notice of vote for the 2021-2022 budget. Do I hear a second? Second. Second by Dr. Cook. Uh, basically to, to follow the statutory procedure and publish a notice of our notice of budget hearing, the notice to intent of intent to exceed revenue neutral rate, and the revenue neutral rate hearing, and notice of vote. I believe those are at our September meeting, and I, right. what, does anybody have that, that date? I, I believe it's the 16th. My, I needed to, thought we'd let the public know for sure what date that is. It's the 16th. September 16th, 5 o'clock, uh, here in this chamber for our meeting. Trustee Cross? Mr. Chair, thank you. For grins and giggles, what happens if we don't do this? If you don't, if you don't follow Senate Bill 13, my understanding of the enforcement mechanism is that you have to pay back everything that would have been collected from taxpayers above last year's revenue neutral amount. That is correct. I'm looking at Kelly, Kelsey, but it's I basically you that. can't. I just want yeah. a reminder. If you take a, a penny more than you took last year without having that special hearing and special vote, you have to pay that back. Um, and then I guess it's distributed by the taxing authorities out to individual taxpayers. But we will certainly follow the law and be transparent as we've always been on our budget things as I've ranted about before. It was really just an excuse to debate it further. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, all those in favor of publishing our notice of budget and the other notices, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. No. That motion carries 6-1 with Trustee Cross voting no. I've got four procurement motions uh, for items we reviewed at the Committee of the Whole meeting. The first three are for single source justifications. These are all listed on page four of the packet. The first one is for Cengage. I move the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration to approve the single source justification for Cengage for continuing education to provide web-based classes for $200,000 for fiscal year 22. Second. Okay. Seconded by Trustee Ingram. Again, all these single source purchase reports were discussed at our Committee of the Whole or, or, or proffered for discussion at the Committee of the Whole. Any discussion on this one? Not all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. That motion carries 7 0. The next is for Pro Train. I move the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration to approve the single source justification for Pro Train for continuing education to provide web-based classes for $150,000 for fiscal year 22. Second. Moved by Trustee Snyder, seconded by Trustee Smith Everett. Discussion or questions? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. That motion carries 7-0. Next is for Johnson Controls. I move the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration to approve the single source justification for Johnson Controls for labor and materials to install new fire alarm systems for $1,117,168.16. Second. Been moved and now seconded by Trustee Ingram to accept that single source purchase. Any discussions or questions? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. That motion carries 7-0. The last is for ABM on-site services for annual housekeeping services. This was a service that was put out to bid and we had five vendors offering proposals. <coughs> I move the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration to approve a one-year contract extension for ABM on-site services for annual housekeeping services for the estimated amount of $762,000 through September 30th, 2022. Do I hear a second? second. 
I'll second. Second by Trustee Ingram. Any questions or comments on this RFP? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. That motion carries 7 0. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report. We'll move along to the president's recommendations for action. The first item there is a treasurer's report, and that will be handled by our treasurer, Trustee Cross. Mr. Chair, I get so caught up in the committee as a whole that I forgot to pull it up. Thank you for your patience. The treasurer's report is included in your board packet, and it is an unaudited treasurer's report for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2021. Some items of note include at page one is the general post-secondary technical education funds summary. Total fiscal 2021 general fund revenues were 2% higher than in fiscal 2020, which was primarily related to property tax revenues resulting from increases in assessed valuation in Johnson County. The college's mill levy rate was unchanged in fiscal 2021. General fund expenses for fiscal year 2021 were 10% lower than in fiscal year 2020. The decreases are due, excuse me, the decreases due to last year's capital spending for one-time facilities master plan projects, including 11 million for renovation of the welding, construction, machining, technology building. The college's general fund unencumbered cash balance was $122 million as of June 30th, 2021. Expenditures, Mr. Chair, and the primary operating funds are apparently within the approved budgetary limits. And therefore, Mr. Chair, it is the recommendation of the college administration that the Board of Trustees approve the Treasurer's Report for the month ended June 30th, 2021, subject to some audit. Is there a second? Second. I so move. Second. Moved by Trustee Cross, seconded by Trustee Smith Everett to approve the Treasurer's Report, subject to audit. Any discussion or questions? Yes, thank you as always to Rachel Lears. And we would say unaudited. It will be audited as part of our annual audit um, that will occur later in the year once that once those books have closed and the auditors can look at them. So we're unaudited until we're audited, uh, but it will be audited by our outside independent accounting. It was firm. on the monitor, so I read it. <laughs> no, no, it's it's okay. important because these are not audited. But I know. make sure everybody knows we're subject to audit. Mr. Chair. Yes, Trustee. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, when we look at the expenses, uh, and I know they're unaudited, but there's a, about a $23 million less actual expenditure than was budgeted. And uh, I would at least have the trustees acknowledge that when you look down through those line items, uh, there are a number of items that are tremendously impacted by the virus, by, by the pandemic. Uh, travel, for example, and uh, development. There's about a million dollars just in those two line items that were redu reduced. So assuming that we get back to some normalcy, I think we need to remember that uh, this, these expenses this year were dramatically impacted uh, by uh, activities that were either canceled or deterred uh, because of the pandemic. But uh, obviously, Mr. Treasurer, a very good report. If I may. Uh, yes, Trustee Cross. I think Trustee Cook has just demonstrated once again why he'll be missed on this board, and thank you for the practical Thank you. Been moved and seconded to accept subject to audit. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. That motion carries 7 0. We're now ready for a recommendation from Dr. Bound on facilities naming. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, for the work of the facilities naming committee as met and brought forward to you for a discussion at our um, earlier committee of the whole meeting, um, and therefore, um, Thanks to uh, the incredible support of David and Mary Zamorowski, and we're bringing forward to you tonight for your consideration uh, a, a naming opportunity. And therefore, it's the, the recommendation of the committee that, the, that you recommend and, and approve, as to approve and accept the recommendation to name two spaces on the first floor of the CLB building associated with a nursing department Zamorowski Family Center for Healthcare Simulation and the clini Clinical Augmented Reality and Virtual Experience Room. And I'd ask you to consider that. Second. Uh, if there's a motion to that effect in a second, then we'll discuss it. So moved. Second. Moved by Trustee Cross, seconded second. by Trustee Smith Everett to accept the recommendation of the Facilities Naming Committee for those two spaces. Uh, discussion? 
Trustee smith ever I have a few comments. Uh, one is I hope we are planning to shorten the clinical augmented reality and virtual experience room to Carver. Is that the plan or because that is a mouthful that I cannot imagine can be easily repeated as your professor is telling you where you are going to meet for the next class. It's my understanding that, that there will that people will most often refer to that room in its more <laughs> simpler acronym, Carver, okay. um, but it will bear the formal name. Okay. So is the um, formal name at the recommend or the request of the Zamorowski family? That's why I was trying to figure out. Yes, that. it is. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. Yes. I wasn't able to discern that in the no, or present Part of our report. Yes. Um, secondary to that is um, a more global question. Um, when I found myself perhaps a little lost on campus uh, for the all staff breakfast this week, I realized there is still quite a bit of signage that um, describes the Carlson or is pointing to the Carlson Center. And I wanted to know if I remember we approved a little while back some uh, signage if I can just get clarity about if that is included in those very little signs that are on campus as well as some of the bigger places we're still um, using Carlson Center. Yep. And I'm going to look to our team and see if there's, my understanding is it's a, a, an overhaul of signage across campus, but I want to double check that. So yes, it is signage across campus, wayfinding, naming, and so forth. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Mr. Chair. Uh, Trustee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I've had a more than one occasion to sit with the Zamorowskis, uh, some Enchanted Evening and other events, and both Dr. David and Dr. Mary um, are two people that really, in my opinion, uh, amplify a concern for students. They're very humble. They're truly about student success, the work that they're doing with our exchange in uh, Nigeria. Africa. What's the country? Um, Ghana, I believe, isn't it? Anyway. U Uganda. Uganda. Thank you, Uganda. And uh, the, I, I, I'm sorry about that, Uganda. And the simulation work they do is just uh, uh, truly, in my opinion, an example of the benefit of students and support to faculty. And I, I can't think of, of a more worthy family to name uh, facilities after than both Dr. David and Dr. Mary Zamorowski. Trustee Snyder. I was just going to note that Trustee Cross and I and a number of other fine fine folks with the college sat on the committee to, uh, I, I guess, forward this to this board uh, and just would note that this followed our the college's policy or procedures for how we go about naming uh, parts of the college. You beat me to that because I, I wanted to read the people that were on that committee because having served on it a couple times, Kate Allen, Marshawn Butler, Lee Cross, Trustee Cross, Dr. Uh, Karen LaMartina, Dr. Jim Liker, Mike Neal, Suze Parker, Trustee Snyder, Janelle Vogler, and Shelby Winner. Um, we have, a, I think, a relatively robust naming policy now. Well, it's been in place for a while. We've, we've updated it, but um, it, it gives us a good opportunity to review the purpose, um, the contributions of the person that would be named after, and I think that's a great process. Trustee Cross, did you have something to add? Y yes, sir, I do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I forget the name of our student from Nepal earlier talking about how I think welcome to Daba. Asta. Uh, if I'm close. Yeah. I'm close? No. Asta Tama. He's, he's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think it just goes to her point that how welcome people feel and how our foundation yeah. staff has helped cultivate that. And so many people have helped cultivate that. So I want to thank the foundation staff. And then I think it was you, sir, Mr. Chair, that helped implement a number of new policies with respect to the naming uh, of new buildings. And so I just wanted to thank you publicly because uh, those were helpful and I think appropriate. So. Thank you. I think the lost opportunity here is in the hospitality and culinary center. We will not be able to have a carver room. <laughs> <laughs> Trustee Lawson, you want to save me? Uh, just to say, man, I think it's fantastic to see these advanced programs continue to bloom on campus. Uh, the Zamorowskis were honored as Johnson County's of the Year in November of 2019. Mm -hmm a well-earned honor, and this will continue to serve this college for a long time. So mm -hmm. all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carries 7-0, and I know Dr. <laughs> Bown and Kate Allen, others will get that word to the, Zamor doc to the Zamorowskis of how thankful we are for their efforts. We absolutely will, and thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to the, the committee that has worked so hard 
uh, to uh, work through the, the nomination and to bring it forward for your consideration. So thank you very much. Well, it is my pleasure now tonight to uh, share my monthly update with you. Um, and so if we could pop that up on the screen, that'll be great. Um, as, I, um, as they're bringing that up, um, the plan for this evening is I'll talk uh, about enrollment for the fall, um, talk about the fall launch of the fall semester, although I'll, I'll piggyback off a little bit of what Dr. Leiker talked about with the start of the, uh, with the Professional Development Day week. Um, and uh, then I'll talk a little bit about shared governance and then uh, stop at the end of my report with a touch of the Kansas Promise Scholarship Program. So um, with that, we're going to jump right there. There you go. There she is again. Asta. Thank you. Um, all right. So enrollment. Um, so enrollment uh, as it stands as of yesterday, um, we have gone through the drop period for uh, non-payment. And we are up 1% in headcount uh, and, and just off of uh, even uh, down 1% in credit hours. Um, and, and so that's, there's good news in that. Um, Dr. Brown? That's, yes. Sorry, that, that's compared to 2019? That's compared to 2020. Oh, compared to last year, okay. 2020, yes, yeah. And I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, about the comparison, and, and particularly I want to take note of the, the trend line. So it, it's uh, the green trend line on here is 2019, the orange is 2020, and the blue one that's difficult to see because it's trailing right alongside uh, the 2019 uh, enrollment pattern. Um, if, if we think about um, the, the balance of this semester and how we go from here to the end of the semester, uh, I think there's some things to, to take note of. For example, approximately 22% of our enrollment is concurrent enrollment. That's yet to hit the books. Um, in my conversations with Dr. McLeod, um, we do expect a strong concurrent enrollment for this fall. Um, and at this point, things are, are leaning towards it will be in a timeline more consistent with what we've experienced in the past, meaning two plus years ago, as opposed to last year, where you may recall um, that um, because of the, uh, the challenges with the start of the school year, particularly for our K-12, our high school partners, um, in determining how to, um, are, we gonna, are they going to be in person, are they going to be virtual, and, and so forth, it led to a delay. So you may recall, at census date last year, we were down 24%. Um, and so now that came back up, and we finished the semester down about 7% for the semester. Um, once the concurrent enrollment kicked in, and then late starting classes. So if we think about the, num the enrollments that will still impact this fall semester, they are as follows. Late starting classes. They include concurrent enrollment and winter session, right? So that's the, the, the uh, term that basically happens between roughly the end of the fall semester and the start of the spring semester. There's that, that block of uh, one month of classes there. Um, those are our opportunity to stay on the positive side of the ledger. Um, and so uh, the good news is um, we're up. Uh, the challenge is we're going to have to work really hard to stay there. Um, and so, you know, the challenge to our team uh, <coughs> is to, um, between things like the Kansas Promise, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, and to look at uh, taking advantage of late starting classes and taking advantage of, of winter term, excuse me, of the winter term, and then also our concurrent enrollment and, and doing what we can to, to continue to foster that. But it's, um, we weren't having this conversation a year ago. I want to, just as um, two months ago, we were saying, now be careful when you look at the numbers. We aren't really up 800%. Um, we're not up 100%. Um, I, I'm gonna caution you when we see enrollment numbers um, at census, which is likely to be up dramatically over it was last year, um, all that means is last year looked goofy. And so now this year, we've got a lot of work to do uh, to get to the end of the semester. But there's a sense of optimism. You certainly see it when you're on campus and, and 
Uh, Asta, I think you would, you would say uh, the student centers happen these days. Um, and so um, uh, there's, there's good news in that. Secondly, if we look at our continuing ed enrollment, and I'm going to look to uh, the fall semester. Um, I will say this, we popped over for this, excuse me, the fall semester, look at the fall months. Um, if we look just very quickly, I don't have it on a chart, but if we go back to, um, uh, to summer, um, uh, we, are, we just popped over, the continuing ed group just popped over 4,000 as their enrollment um, for the summer. Now, the, the, the one number, right, their, their target has been 5,000. Um, there's a number um, that, that is still very much within the realm of reasonable to think we can get there because the adult basic ed enrollment all gets captured as summer enrollment. So the enrollment that happens throughout this year, just by the way it works, gets captured because there's one enrollment cycle and it happens to be summer. Okay, so we are, from a continuing ed standpoint, um, you know, we're at what, 105% of this point in time last year. So if we look at fall now, the chart in front of you, um, we're 142% of, of where we were at this point in time last year and about 65% of where we were two years ago. Um, the, the estimate is, um, and we'd expect, if you look at the estimate, that would put us at about 12% over where we were for fall enrollment last year. So continuing that enrollment uh, continues to be strong. Um, uh, Elisa and the team are, are working really hard, um, everything between uh, uh, stimulus funds to support uh, training, as well as the ABE work, um, just really, really working hard there. So. Wanted to give you the good news from an enrollment standpoint. Um, this week, as, as Dr. Leiker said, has been an absolutely amazing busy week on campus. Um, we had um, 100, we've had 110 sessions held on a variety of topics. You can see it on the screen. I don't need to read it to you. Um, with 90 plus percenters um, involved in this work. And if I remember correctly, we had about 2,600 um, session, well, uh, people attending sessions. So if I attended three sessions, I get counted three times. So there were a, about 2,600 attendees at various times throughout the week. Um, uh, as you know, and thank you for those who were able to participate um, in yesterday's all staff meeting, um, I, I will say um, it was wonderful to be in Yardley Hall. Um, and to not have people, well, actually the feeling wasn't a lot different than it was last time I was speaking in Yardley Hall. Um, and that was, I guess that wasn't the last time. I'm rambling. <laughs> when I was being interviewed during the grilling, mm -hmm. um, uh, that was the last time I, other than graduation, <laughs> never mind. All right, um, I, so I just want to say thank you to our PDD team, um, uh, to Farrell and Rachel, just really done uh, fantastic work. Incredibly pleased with the work that they do. Um, as uh, Dr. Liker uh, referenced, new faculty orientation took place last week, and a couple of you had a chance to be with them. I had a chance to be with them as well on, on Thursday morning. Um, and then this afternoon, we had the opportunity um, to recognize um, some 246 of our colleagues who have reached a milestone in their employment with Johnson County Community College, whether it's through five years of service, um, it, you know, it, it goes in the, the 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40 um, uh, milestones. And uh, um, I am just uh, incredibly thankful um, and, and proud of the longevity that we have with the people who are so dedicated to serving our students so well. Um, uh, Susan Brown uh, was there and, uh, um, and, and Margaret um, uh, Lejudice, I think, is how I was told to pronounce it. So um, Margaret was not with us today, but Susan was and uh, uh, just spoke to the, her passion for this place. And it was absolutely incredible. And I am most appreciative of our employees. Um, 
In addition, this week, um, as Dr. Leiker, we, ref we recognized um, three of our retirees, um, uh, Dr. Dennis Day, Julie Haas, and Dr. Jeff Siebert. Um, and uh, uh, Dr. Siebert passed away um, two years ago. Um, but each of these um, folks, it was, it was such an honor and privilege to, um, to celebrate with Dennis and Julie and then also uh, Jeff's wife and sister. Um, uh, just <coughs> amazing. These folks have had a profound impact. And they represent you know, those who continue to serve the college so, so very well. Uh, I want to talk for a moment about shared governance. I shared this during the um, all staff meeting yesterday, but at, at the front end of the school year now, it's time to kick back in with shared governance and particularly the, the uh, launching of a college council. Um, some slight modifications to the model that was originally considered. Um, we're, we're going to ask um, to have two students join us. One of the things that we found, particularly in the strategic planning process, for instance, um, that when you have one student representative, if the student can't make it, then there's no student voice there. And so for us, it's important. So we'll be approaching uh, staff, we'll be approaching uh, you all to, to help us um, uh, identify two students to serve. Um, in addition, um, the, the um, faculty representation originally was three. We've increased it to four. Um, and uh, representation from ABC as, as the shared governance structure, the formal shared governance structure, um, and also wanting to make sure that counselors are represented um, or have a liaison, um, as Sherry Barrett would be sure to tell me. Um, and, and again, the reason for that is that in the shared governance structure that we have today, um, there's a there's the academic branch council, which represents the academic branch, and then there's a staff council. So there's a branch council and a staff council, so there's a little bit of a, a wonkiness there, um, if you will, um, and it, because uh, counselors don't see themselves as staff, technically they're faculty, but technically they're also not a part of the academic branch, we thought that it was important that they have voice in this process as well. Um, other than that, the, the model looks the same. Um, our plan is, uh, well, let me say one other thing. Um, uh, in the original plan, there was going to be a dean's representative. representative. We've included that within the staff structure. Um, and so uh, that's the model. Um, our plan is, uh, I've asked um, ABC um, to identify um, the representatives by the end of September would be the target so that we can begin our work in October. Um, and, and at that time, we'll put together, figure out what the leadership structure looks like uh, and, and a process for identifying and working through issues and, and so forth that come to uh, the council. To me, in essence, what does that mean? It really means having a charter and, and uh, bylaws for how we operate um, so that we can have a consistent pattern of how do we raise issues for discussion and so forth? How, would, how do we decide what we're going to work on or what we're going to discuss and what we might not discuss because we make a decision not to? So we have some structure to do that. Um, and so that's the, the plan for this fall semester. Our hope is that um, by the time spring semester rolls on, we've got things buttoned down and we're moving forward um, with the structure. Um, and then finally, the Kansas Promise. So in front of you, um, there are a few pieces of information. Um, so uh, there is a uh, poster, if you will. Um, and again, if, if there are any of these that you're like, you know what, I don't need that. Um, for example, the poster, if you say, you know what, I'm not gonna put it up on my bedroom wall, um, uh, then you know, you're welcome to leave it here and, and we will certainly use it. Um, but in addition to that, um, you have uh, the um, piece it puts together that explains the program, uh, a booklet, and then a one-pager that shows the programs that are eligible um, uh, through the program. Um, so to date, we've received about 813 applications, wow. um, at least as of this afternoon. 
Um, what we know right now is that approximately 450 of those um, did not meet the eligibility requirements. Um, and there are roughly 300 applications that are still very quickly moving um, um, through the process. Uh, we have awarded $196,000 uh, worth of scholarship dollars to 61 students. And there are, as of right now, we know that there are six students, for example, who have declined, who would have been eligible for the scholarship, but have made the decision not to accept the scholarship for a variety of reasons. Um, as of now, as of this afternoon, we are anticipating that Governor Kelly is coming to campus next Wednesday. So you will get details uh, tomorrow, uh, inviting you to attend um, uh, Wednesday. We believe it will be Wednesday, the 25th at 1.30. She um, plans to come to campus to, uh, to sign the legislation, to sign the bill. Um, and so, uh, we'll be very pleased to have her here on campus. We'll be inviting many others from uh, the community. Um, in addition, we'll be inviting um, uh, Dr. Spittle from Mid-American Nazarene as they're a, a partner school um, in the program, as well as uh, Greg Mosier, who's the president at KCK. Um, and so we're, we're excited about the progress that's taking place. Um, uh, Randy's team has moved into a high gear. Um, uh, certainly, um, really just appreciate the work that's happening there. It's a, it is candidly a very labor intensive process um, uh, to move from application to advising, guiding students really well so that they fully understand uh, the commitments they're making because they are um, for the investment that the state is happy to make in them and their future. We want them to understand that they also are signed on to, to commitments of staying, uh, living, and working in the state of Kansas. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes my report. Um, I know we'll probably have some questions. My, my, I still think we need to address in the Promise program, and maybe after one year we can know more, have more information, that the, the commitment to live two years and work two years in Kansas or have to pay it back is a detriment to Kansas City, Kansas Community College and Johnson County Community College. And I, my, I'm just throwing out, live or work one place for three years, live in Kansas for three years, but it, there are so many jobs in Missouri and this metro area is a metro area. And I think that's gonna be a reason we're gonna lose some students that otherwise might qualify and might be able to do it. So I hope we'll continue to look at that. And I know you and I have talked about that. And, and I will say that can't, that is a practical reality that we're already <laughs> facing, that students are weighing that very carefully, um, uh, understanding the commitment that they're making. And, and I don't mind the commitment. I think it's important when it's Kansas tax dollars, but the making it rational and reasonable for a border county is important. Trustee Cross. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, I agree with you, Mr. Chair. And, uh, you know, I need to brush up on my constitutional law, but I'm not exactly sure it's constitutional to restrict uh, uh, travel or movement like that. But I suppose if they're handing out money, but you know, good luck enforcing it. Uh, nevertheless, I did want to say to Mr. Uh, President, Dr. Bowne, uh, I grew up in Lawrence and, and a KU basketball fan, and I was trying to think of something nice to say to you. I'm not one to say nice things, uh, but... Um, <laughs> Just because uh, Jim Valvano's teams barely won games doesn't mean he wasn't a good coach. Thank you for your report. If you run around the court afterwards looking for somebody to hug, <laughs> one of us will jump for it. We'll, we'll, we'll volunteer. <laughs> Other questions on uh, Dr. Bounds' report? Um, Trustee Lawson. Uh, yeah, it was fantastic. I think I keep coming back to the all staff meeting and what you said in that meeting was so powerful. And I know the public has an opportunity to take a look at that link and watch that. And I really recommend that you do. I think the things that really stand out to me is to make sure that our college is student ready and that we are not elitist college. So we need to serve the students that come to us. And the request that you made of everybody in that room, everybody asking, regardless of what position you are in, to really um, make a commitment to be responsible for the student success. And as I've been looking around on our short-term certification programs, the one thing that I really wanna highlight for anybody that is needing a 
career change. Somebody, anybody that is looking for new employment but doesn't have two years to wait. There is a Microsoft Azure certification. There's fundamentals and administrator. And it is 13 days, 12 classes, about $4,000. And it also is collaborated with the partners of SLU Workforce Center. Maybe Dr. Brown, you can talk a little bit more about that. But I really recommend anybody watching to be able to take a look at our short-term certification programs through Continuing Ed. It's a, a very quick way to turn around and maintain status quo for family, for anybody that needs to and wants to stay in Johnson County. So just wanted to make sure that I take that commitment very seriously. Thank you. Thank you. And yes, we have many short-term training opportunities, and, and for many of them, and at least I don't know if you'd like to come forward and just provide a quick update. I mean, there, there are so many opportunities from a short-term yeah. uh, training opportunity that leads to great careers. I'm thinking of CDL and so many others that are short-term and can yield uh, great opportunities for great careers. Yeah, thank you. Elisa Waldman, Interim Vice President of Continuing Education. Um, thank you, Chesty Lawson, for lifting that up. Um, you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. uh, on the continuing ed side of the college, um, we have hundreds of certifications that are available. And there are certificates, mm -hmm. there are industry certifications, um, and then, of course, coursework. Um, the, many of those industry certifications are tied directly to uh, requirements for jobs mm -hmm. and positions, and also for people increasing uh, the position that they're in or, or you know, getting new positions. So we create those based on the needs that we see in the workforce and learn about, and they're tied directly to that, to providing those skills. Uh, many, many computer courses, and you mentioned uh, SLU that we work in collaboration with SLU. That is a new partnership that we've entered into recently with St. Louis University. And so we are working together with them, offering many of their on, live online certification classes in computer applications and IT, mm -hmm. bringing to our students and our community classes that we had not offered in the past mm -hmm. that complement the ones we have. So often it's the next class in a stackable credential um, or stackable certifications. So we're able to expand that tremendously with the cooperation of SLU. And we're very excited about that. It's going very well. And the last thing I would add is that um, many of those that you were addressing mm -hmm. might be eligible for our CE training awards, mm -hmm. which is using our HERF funds. Um, and so for those who are unemployed or underemployed, mm -hmm. that $4,000 price tag becomes zero yeah. if they are eligible. And it's a very easy process. Uh, to date, we have offered over $400,000 of classes, uh, funded over $400,000 of classes with the CE Training Awards just since March. Mm -hmm. So I would really encourage anyone interested in short-term training to ask us about the short-term about the training awards because we might be able to make that very, very affordable. Yeah, what really stood out for me about the Microsoft Azure certification was that 80% of enterprises are going to be moving to cloud by 2025. So high demand professionals who can develop those cloud applications. If you had, the classes are about 4,000, if you can offset it with that award, you can turn around in 13 days, 12 classes, a job that pays $80,000 to $160,000. I mean, that is a game changer for somebody who really needs to get back in the workforce. So I think it's so imperative to be able to highlight these short-term certification programs during our board meeting, because to have a deep commitment for student success is to be able to know what, what is possible, what's out there. So thank you. Thank you, and that is one of many. So Dr. Baum mentioned CDL as well, commercial driving, yeah. um, another hotly uh, populated and very much in demand. And uh, we're expanding that program constantly. And again, covered by the training awards for many. So thank you, I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. I will say in your um, president's report, I was shocked and of course, always surprised that we have an RV course that is, I, I laughed out loud and then I said, of course we do. And that would be really important for some of those RVs that are as big as semi-trucks that you would need to learn how to drive. 
Um, my question is about our concurrent enrollment. Just to clarify language and make sure that I have it right, is concurrent enrollment exclusively our College Now students? Or does no, it include not. other? No. Can, can you tell me what the yeah. others are for my own yeah. understanding, please? For <laughs> Uh, again, Mickey McLeod, uh, Executive Vice President, Academic Affairs. Uh, our concurrent enrollment spans multiple different offerings. So it is College Now, it is Quick Step Plus, uh, which is primarily through our math department, College Algebra. It includes um, our uh, College and Career Ready uh, through uh, Blue Valley, which has which is just now being extended. Um, to, to Shawnee Mission and Olathe this year after piloting last year. Uh, and it includes a number of, of students who self-select into individual programs. Um, and then we work with their counselor based on the fact that they have achieved far enough that, they, that there's nothing left for them to offer at the high school. Okay. And so we're trying to weave those students into the bucket of the of the college and career ready piece um, and that partnership so that we can have one place to collect that information as opposed to individual students matriculating alone that we have to go try and cherry pick to get the data together. Okay, thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Trustee Cross, you have a question? I just had a, I did have a question, just a point of clarification I may ask of Trustee Lawson. She said 85% of businesses, I had not heard that statistic, I just, it said 80% of enterprises will be moving to cloud by 2025. I thank you for that. I, yeah. Okay, Dr. Mount, thank you. Uh, very helpful to have that, and I, I think we all appreciate the slide presentation. Uh, the next item on the agenda is new business. I'm not aware of any new business, old business. We have a short report, I think, from the Subcommittee on Trustee Orientation and we, Policy. We, we're not gonna discuss Big 12 Conference at new business? <laughs> Um, not yet. Okay. No, I'll hold that. <laughs> Trustee Ingram and Trustee Smith Everett. I think Trustee Ingram, are you going? Are you going? I am. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The subcommittee on orientation and policy met this month. We discussed the two prongs of our directive. After hearing that there were concerns about addressing our 100 series board policies in this subcommittee, we would like to request that addressing the 100 series policies be done after the new board is sworn in, or the next board, I should say, is sworn in in January 2022. We would recommend taking the feedback provided by this board, which our understanding is that um, most or some members have submitted their um, feedback to Terry. We would ask that all members of this board submit their feedback about our 100 policies to Terry. Um, we have not been privy to that information, so we have not seen those uh, notes or recommendations, but we felt that this would allow um, input from both boards and allow us, the subcommittee, to focus our full attention on the nature of orientation for new trustees. Um, we are considering bringing a recommendation for a policy on a standard review pro process for our policies. Um, <laughs> a policy for our policies, if you will, that would stipulate um, what our regular ongoing review of them should be so that in the future we are not um, subject to uh, just randomly deciding to review them, but having a clear cut understanding of when our policy should be reviewed. Um, so as a reminder, the feedback about our board policies is due to Terry by September 10th and the deadline will not be extended. So. Um, at this time, oh, so I do have this note. At this time, only one trustee has completed that review and provided feedback. And so in order to be inclusive, we need everyone to provide input. Um, the second part of my report is really about the uh, orientation nature of our directive. And um, we spent time this month examining our orientation materials and experiences and now would like to request your input. Terry will be sending out a simple four question trustee orientation survey from us uh, after this meeting this evening. And we request that you complete it by next Thursday, giving you one week. Um, it's only four questions, but uh, so it shouldn't take too long. We do ask for your honest perspective, 
um, and your feedback on the survey so that we can use it to guide our recommendations. Next, we will bring to the Committee of the Whole on Monday, August 30th, a set of recommendations for new trustee orientation. This set of recommendations will include feedback that you all provide us, guidelines from ACCT, KACCT, um, and any additional information we believe is critical for new trustees at JCCC to be um, successful. So we will share those with you at the Committee of the Whole meeting where you will have the opportunity to provide us input. Um, finally, at the Board of Trustee meeting on 916, we will finalize those recommendations and then present them to the board to be passed on to our president and chairman who share that responsibility of onboarding all new trustees. Um, I, that was a lot and I can take any questions that you might have at this time. I, I just appreciate your optimism on those dates. <laughs> those are some pretty short time them. frames. One, one week from today, the orientation survey should be re replied to, which is August 26th. Mm -hmm. And then you would have bring something to the August 30 Committee of the Whole. Mm -hmm. Okay. If, that if is correct. You guys are you're committed to that and have the time to do it. Um, Figured it out. I don't, I don't have a problem with it other than um, that's pretty fast. And the, the school teacher and you is coming out and both of you. Uh, okay. It's Questions 30, for them. It's not 30 days, is it? No. And she said no deadlines. <laughs> Heard judges say that. Trustee Lawson. Uh, so I know that this was old business and as new business and priorities come about, uh, I know the college has said just yesterday that they're chartering bylaws. So I would request that any type of policies of policies wait until we see what the college's bylaws are so that our, the board okay. rules of engagement are not yeah. different than the college's rules of engagement. I, the, the bylaws, I think, that Dr. Mann was talking about was for the college council, not for the right. college as a whole. Right. It would be that governing the shared governance structure, which yeah. would be the college council. It's not, they're not bringing to make any policies that would be college-wide. College and what you're talking about is policies within the Series 100 that would deal with how the board is going to, A, review its own policies in a time, on a periodic basis, and, and two, set up a process for ensuring there is an orientation guidance we, we had not gone that far okay. our only policy recommendation which we were going to bring we were going to try to put it together for committee of the whole so we can look at it then more formally on what the language would be is simply to just put a policy in place that gives us a um recommend a, a, a recommendation of um or a requirement for annual review or biannual review of our policies because currently we actually have nothing that stipulates we have to review our policies on our, right, our, our um, board only 100 series policies. That's what I'm talking about. Um, that And we, as we have reviewed our policies in uh, our committees with our co greater college community as a whole, many of those policies stipulate that we, they have to be reviewed and you know, such and such time frame. Well, for our board policies, we don't have any mechanism like that which then leads it to be subjective to when we, whenever we decide to review them, which we didn't think was a very good way to make sure that we as a board in our self-governance are reviewing those in a frequency that um, makes sense. So I guess uh, we have one side that says the 100 series policies will be after the election so that both boards can be a part of that decision-making process. Wouldn't that policy that you're talking about go along with that so wouldn't both of those just wait because it sounds like the reason to even look at these policies right now there's nothing current about it this is just someone decided hey we need to start looking at our policies but i think it might provide more faith to the community to do everything after the election so both sides both boards can have a say in in all the policy making right that makes sense i think that um I mean, if you if we made a policy now, I think our concern, and maybe I'll just speak for myself first, my concern is that we, having no mechanism for review, if we get the new board elected and we don't have that mechanism that says this has to be reviewed, these board policies have to be reviewed annually, we could just forget that we were going to review them and a whole other year goes by before we, have, or before the next board um, takes a real look at those 100 series policies. So I wanted to offer 
a mechanism that a policy now that says we will review them annually or biannually, whatever we decide, but that new board would ha be able to um, offer their opinion and contributions in the review process of all the 100 series policies because that would be a new 100 series policy. Mm -hmm. I guess I, at some point we're gonna have to ask the question, why did this even come up? So I think maybe uh, just some type of good faith that whatever decisions are made about the 100 series that both boards are, have a chance to be able to have a say in that. Right, and I think from, from my standpoint, I think that that's a really critical question that I don't want to come up um, in, in other work that in the, in the next couple of years because we don't have any mechanism that requires us to, to renew them. And so it is sort of just subject to um, you know, the chairman's discretion or if board members bring up that, that we want to review those 100 series because we have nothing that, set, that requires us to look at them um, in, any, in any regular manner. And, and if I could... We do periodically prompt the board to look at the 100 series we have, but it's, it's just not in, in Yes, yeah, there's no formal, I mean, from our standpoint, when I looked at the 100 series policies for my own, to offer my own contribution to what we're sending to Terry, it kind of stuck out that there's nothing officially in our 100 series policies that stipulates it. So may, may I, I know your office does that on a regular basis, but we don't have anything written for I guess I just May I simplify this? Can I, I think I can simplify this. There, there are two processes going on here. The one would be to, you guys would offer a recommendation on a policy that says, when are we going to look at our series 100 policies? Is it every year? Is it every two years? Is it even numbered years? And that's, that's, what would, that's one side of it. The other part would be the actual review of our series 100 policies. You are recommending we not do any actual review until the new board is in place in January but we want the input from the current board because we've all lived with them mm -hmm. for at least, I guess everybody here, at least four years. No, well, two years for you, mm -hmm. Trustee Smith-Everett. So I don't, I don't know why we, I mean, I don't, haven't seen what you're gonna present, but I don't know why we wouldn't go ahead and adopt a policy that says, here's how frequently we're gonna review our own policy so that it's on the books. And I think that's all that's being proposed. And I'm just asking to, if there's a reason to wait a few months, why not just wait on this one as well? Uh, I don't want it to look rushed, and it seems like even the chairman said that's pretty fast. So it just seems like it could be imperative to. Let's make it clear what the chairman everything. said. The chairman said it's rushed on the orientation review to get our survey responses due by next week and a committee of the whole report on August 30th. I was not speaking in any way to the college policy review because this subcommittee was appointed two months ago uh, by this board without objection and has been moving forward. Um, and I, I think we're making this way more complicated than it needs to be. Uh, the new board is going to do the review. This board can choose, if it wants, to set a schedule for review of Series 100 policies. That was my thoughts. Okay. okay. Trustee Ingram. Well, the other thing that I would like to add is I think when this came up, we were discussing orientation. And we've got new board members coming in up to four board members coming in. You know, that's the reality. And the, the policies that govern us should be part of that orientation at some level. I don't know what it is. I'm not, it, this, is, this is not gonna be our thing. Um, but, but we really had looked at, you know, one is not separate from the other um, to some degree. You know, if you've got new board members coming in and we're going to put them through orientation, we want them to at least review the policies that govern us at this time. So I think that's where all of this started. When we looked at the, the policies, they had not been reviewed okay. since 2017, either yeah. 2017, 2018. You know, we started on this right after, you know, I mean, just putting, putting our orientation materials together. So we have been working on it and we are prepared to meet those deadlines. I know you know that. But I think this this just started out as a natural consequence, one of the other. So that's all I would suggest. Well, I, I will tell you, 
why, why I think it started out is in 2017 when I was chair, the legal department, when I was last chair, the legal department came and said Series 100 hasn't been looked at for a while. So I worked with uh, Tanya Wilson, our, our, direct, our general counsel at the time, looking through those, but there wasn't any process. And that's what I think Trustee Smith ever you spoke to. It is now four years later and we had not looked at them. And I'm chair again and I didn't think it was as appropriate for me to simply do the review with legal counsel. So I ask you to, if you would commit time to it and you agreed to it and the board appointed the this, this subcommittee. So I'm looking forward to your report at the August 30th um, Committee of the Whole on both the, the orientation and then a, a schedule timing for future reviews of, of the Series 100 policies. And, and just to be clear, I appreciate that our legal department does that and prompts us, but I feel really strongly, especially when I read our national literature from the ACCT, that we are to self-govern. That is one of the most critical things. And um, I think having um, the 100 series in a regular part of our review is really critical to us self-governing. So we all know the policies that are supposed to be um, guiding us that we use to function as a board. So. Are there any Further discussion? So we will look for this four question survey uh, immediately and everybody will have it turned in by Monday, next Thursday at the deadline. Another one too, right? uh, and, then, and then comment on the series 100 policies by no. September 10th. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, let's move on to old, uh, that's old business, the consent agenda. Uh, consent agenda is a grouping of individual items that have been reviewed by staff or a routine or otherwise uh, uh, ready for approval under our policies. They're usually handled in one vote and one motion. Um, if any trustee wishes to pull something from the consent agenda, uh, we will consider it separately. Are there any items on this month's consent agenda that anybody wants to consider separately? Can I make this, a, oh, go ahead. Trustee Ingram? No, go ahead. Oh. I didn't want to pull it off, but I, I just wanted to make a comment that our, I find our grants to be incredible. And I read through them very thoroughly each time. <laughs> and there are several this time that I am just um, I'm in awe that we are applying for, that we, um, some of them we, we got issued. Um, and I appreciate all the work that goes into those. I, they have such a big impact, and um, that is my comments. I think that would be a good once a year committee of the whole report is our grants department because the total number of dollars they bring into this campus allows us to be this campus. So, uh, and seeing them on a monthly basis, we see them, but I think it would be good to have a report from that office. Trustee Ingram. I am so sorry I deferred to you because you <laughs> took sorry. the wind out of my sails. I was actually gonna look though at numbers three, four, and five, which did include the grants. You are absolutely right. And I think sometimes we just don't recognize them. We're all looking at them, we're reading them, or we're aware of them, but they are, they are powerful. The other thing that I wanted to point out was the affiliation, articulation, reverse transfer, cooperative, and other agreements. And that goes back to even what Trustee Lawson was saying about Dr. Bounds' words yesterday and how important, you know, what can we be doing, um, you know, to just continue to move forward and certainly uh, the affiliations. I always look to see, you know, which are the new ones, who's coming on board, who are we missing and those kinds of things. And I think those are really important things for us as trustees to be taking a look at. And then finally, uh, that transfer the JCCC Foundation Tribute Fund. It really struck me yesterday when they were panning the names of the people who had retired over the past year, and, and I couldn't see them from where I was sitting very well, but I knew what was being up there and, and panned, and the, the people who have left this institution through COVID, and we really, you know, we just feel like we haven't been able to thank like we wish that we could. So I did want to recognize the three people who were listed in here, Barbara Greenwood, Valerie Gross, and Carol Beth Ramirez, we don't always do that. I understand that completely, but their donations to the various funds are always listed in here and those are appreciated. So I just wanted to make note of that as well. So thank you. Okay. Trustee smith Everett. I did have another, I Certainly. just found it on my notes. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm getting a sore neck here. <clears throat> um, for our articulation agreement, thank you, Trustee. Um, Ingram, because I had a question about one, which was 
the Hispan Greater Kansas City Hispanic Development yes. Fund. Um, it's on page 29 of the thank agenda. Thank you. Um, so my question on that was, it runs for one year. The last sentence on that, it says it runs for one year and includes a $7,500 partnership commitment from JCCC to this fund. And I, um, if now is not the time, which is okay, I just wanted to know more about it. I have followed them for a while and um, was really glad to see that we're, um, we have an agreement. I don't know if that's new. Um, it says new, but I didn't know if, if we've done new. that in the past. But I just wanted to know about that um, partnership, the $7,500 contribution. Yep. Yes. Yeah, so it's, it's a partnership uh, supporting, um, uh, to support in the organization, the Greater Kansas City uh, Hispanic Development Fund. And it's a partnership uh, around uh, supporting uh, students and their families and helping them to be college ready and finding the right opportunities, for example, to come to Johnson County Community College. Um, and it's been a, a, a partnership that's been in place for some time, and uh, we're choosing to join uh, them in partnership uh, to support our, our Hispanic students. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Move the adoption of the consent agenda. Second. Been moved by Trustee Cook and seconded by Trustee Cross to approve the consent agenda. Uh, any further discussion or questions about it? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. That motion carries 7 0. Um, we do have an executive session today before we can adjourn. I'd like to entertain a motion to go into executive session for consultation with legal counsel on a pending legal matter, which would be deemed privileged in the attorney client relationship. No action will be taken during this session. The executive session will last for 45 minutes beginning at 6.50 p.m. and ending at 7.35 p.m. That's 45 minutes, right? Mm -hmm. um, 6.50 p.m. to 7.35 p.m., at which time open session will resume uh, in this room. Uh, we would like to invite Dr. Andy Bound, Dr. Andy Weber, and Kelsey Nazar to join the executive session. Um, I assume that it, the Zoom will re resume in this session as well at 7.35 p.m. Do I hear such a motion? Trustee Cross, Cross so moved, second. and I will I second. We Trustee Cross moved and Trustee Snyder seconded. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. Yeah. Aye. aye. Opposed, no. That motion passes 7-0. We will return to open session at 7.35 p.m. Thank you all. Uh, we are back from our executive session at 7.35 p.m. Uh, no action was taken during the executive session. We have nothing left on our agenda except a motion to adjourn. I'll accept such a motion. So moved. Second. Moved by Trustee Everett Smith. Smith, excuse me. I haven't done that in months and months. In a while. Moved by Trustee Smith Everett and seconded by Trustee Ingram. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. That motion carries 6-0. Trustee Cook being absent. We are adjourned.